the rate at which technology changes it ex is extremely fast, and we understand that. And what we found through research and just talking with these highest performing companies is that in teams, is that they're trying to change not quite as fast as technology, but as fast as they can when it comes to rapid improvement and trying to be more consumer driven. And the typical businesses just aren't. They're trying to change, they slowly change based off of their, the model that they're trying to um, make and it's just not as fast. So the one thing that we noticed was that there's something really important about the highest performing teams and businesses. And I'm gonna explain that to you by explaining my morning. When I get up in the morning, my uh, phone wakes me up, and I'm actually gonna pause there. Who uses their phone as their alarm clock? Okay, so look around if you're not raising your hand. Uh, who gets pissed off when somebody's ringtone is your alarm tone? So if you ever wanted to understand the importance of mobile technology, that's pretty much it. It screws with you when somebody's ringtone is your alarm tone. So I wake up with my phone, look at my phone, New York Times on my phone, check Instagram, make sure somebody likes the 1,000th picture of my infant son. I look at Facebook, I scroll through my email, I get up, I go for a run, track everything on my wrist, heart rate, goes to my app, tells me how unhealthy I am, right? I get into the kitchen, drink a glass of water, talk to a cylinder on my counter about whether the baby wipes shipment has gone out from Amazon. And then Alexa, the cylinder, then reads back the news to me that I already read on the New York Times, right? I get in my car, my car, well I shower because I ran, but after that, I get my, my shower's not that cool. So get in my car, Matt pops up, tells me how to get to work. My car can even drive itself sometimes, and I don't do it very often because I'm afraid it's gonna wreck, but I get to work and I walk into work and it's the exact opposite. It's the exact opposite experience of what I had as a consumer. And something is wrong with that equation. When it is instant and seamless, and when I get into the work environment, it's the exact opposite. So what we found was that individuals us as consumers, and I'm not talking about millennials. When Louis C.K. was talking about the idiot generation, it's everyone, it's everybody in this room, it's not just me, it's just not the millennials. We all use technology in the same way. And you are, your rate of change as a consumer is so much faster as you as a professional. Okay, so what we found was that the highest performing teams tried to act more like those individuals, and there's really two rules that we went through in order to become as close to these change agents as possible, and that includes Google, Amazon, Facebook, Alibaba, all these consumer tech companies that control the majority of the consumer mind share and over 250 billion in cash. 250 billion in cash means what to all of us? They can do whatever the hell they want, whenever they want. They could spend a billion dollars and, and feel like they lost a dollar, right? They just have a lot of money, so they can change things quickly. And we'll talk about Amazon later, but two rules. Every customer is a consumer first and the consumer experiences are seamless and constantly changing. And the second one is move from numbers keeping score to numbers that drive better actions. So we're gonna talk about the first rule. And the thing to understand is that the generational conversation is only applicable in a few, in a few ways. We are a Google generation and Google generation means we are constantly searching for things. I read a stat recently that said when Google went out for five minutes, it had a five minute outage, 40% of the internet went down. 100 billion Google searches a month. And it's training us to need some, when we want something, we need it now. We are asking Siri, who's kind of terrible, or we're asking Alexa what the recipe is for spaghetti and she's telling us. And it's not really a she, right? It's a robot. And then Terminator comes back and kills us all, but I'm not gonna talk about that because that's depressing. <laughs> And then Amazon further built that out with the patent that they uh, won in 1999. Does anybody want to guess what that patent was? Anyone? One-click purchasing. Buy now with one click. I can be walking a stroller, and I can even tell Alexa, just order the wipes again. And Alexa orders it. It's seamless. And now you have the Domino's app where you don't even have to click to order pizza. And it's terrible. Does that, has anybody ever tried it? You basically take out the phone, open the app, and then it counts down 10 seconds and orders the pizza, the last pizza you ordered before. A little bit over the top, right? A little bit too seamless. 
And then you have just-in-time manufacturing, right? It's a manufacturing system in which components are delivered immediately before they're required in order to minimize inventory costs. I would lump 3D printing into this. It's completely changing the way we produce things, and it's only going to get more um, applicable to what you do. Amazon actually patented anticipatory shipping, and I know Walmart does this with weather, but it says it may box and ship products it expects customers in a specific area will want based on previous orders and other factors. What creeps me out is the last line, <laughs> and other factors. I am convinced that Alexa is listening to everything that I'm saying. Who has Alexa in here? Who has Google Home, something? She is, or it is, he is, whatever, whatever gender you want to put on it. Um, but it's training, oh, and then, of course, it could be delivered by drone. I know Carla talked about this. I can't imagine what's going to happen when drones are delivering items across uh, states that have lax gun laws, because you can imagine <laughs> shooting down drones to get watches or whatever, but that's going to happen. They just had a patent where they built out, um, they're actually going to have drones Massive drones that release little drones to deliver things. It's basically a floating warehouse. Yeah, I know. It's pretty weird, right? And then, of course, you have the assistants, uh, AIs. I actually have a pretty funny story in terms of Alexa listening. I, my wife and I were talking one day about uh, be beans, which is kind of weird, but black beans, because we, we eat a lot of black beans, which is too much information. But <laughs> we, uh, we were talking about it, and then a day later, this package showed up on our steps, and it was 50 cans of black beans from Amazon. And I was sitting there going, Rachel, why, my wife, did you order 50 cans? We don't eat that many black beans. She was like, I did not order any black beans. Who? And then we looked at Alexa, and we were like, oh, no. <laughs> Alexa actually ordered black beans because for some reason she thought at some time I had said, or Alexa, order black beans. It's kind of creepy, right? But it's completely changing the way we are experiencing things. The last example I have, and then we'll move on to the second rule, is anybody familiar with Amy Ingram? Anybody in the room? X.AI is also Andrew Ingram. If you guys recall, and you could probably go back to your inboxes and search for the name Amy Ingram, Amy Ingram is actually a robot. It's a personal assistant. You can go sign up for a monthly subscription, and Amy will book all of your meetings for you. And it is almost seamless. I have some examples of emails. She will follow up with the people you're supposed to meet. And all you have to do is copy amy at x.ai on the email and say, Amy, could you book coffee with Josh Miles um, for over the next couple weeks? And she will book it. And she will set the time, set the date, send reminders. And it's all seamless. And it's all a robot. And it is completely changing the way I'm thinking about certain things I do at work, and a lot of people are using it. They've actually had Amy asked out on dates. They've had flowers sent to the office for Amy, and it's a robot, which is even creepier. But she is that lifelike, or he, or it, whatever you want to say. But it's changing the way I'm experiencing things. And the one thing to keep in mind is that customers, and I said this at the beginning, are consumers first. Your buyers, and I have to keep this in mind as a B, in B2B software as well. We are consumers first. We are being trained by the Amazons of the world to want seamless experiences no matter what we buy. And again, it's not millennial. We are all being trained this way. The experience is completely seamless. And not to mention Amazon now buying Whole Foods for a distribution center. And I can walk into an Amazon Go store without ever talking to a cashier and walk out with my groceries, and it's all done through the app. They're completely changing a lot of industries, and it's just important to watch and learn what they're doing and how they're creating these seamless experiences. So a couple things to keep in mind. How many times does someone have to click to contact you? If your phone number on your website is not clickable on a mobile phone, we got to talk. Or you need to talk to your website provider. It's just one experience. What does your website look like on a mobile phone? What happens when someone calls your office? Do you have a service level agreement for response times to a prospect or a customer from your employees? 
Do you know every touch point of the journey, both prospect and customer? And are you teaching the company about the experience as marketers? Do you know why people buy from you and what process they go through to do it? I don't care if you have a 30-day sales cycle, which I know probably none of you in this room have, or a two-year sales cycle. The experience is everything. The second rule is move from numbers keeping score to numbers that drive better actions. It's my favorite quote on the face of the planet. It's from David Walmsley. He was head of multi-channel for Marks and Spencer, which is a retailer over in Europe. And it's brilliant because it keeps us as marketers from saying, well, we beat that goal last quarter, let's go for another one, instead of looking at how can we use these numbers to drive better actions in what we're doing on a daily basis. Because we are responsible for the one source of truth for the company, which is your customer database. You could have millions, like a consumer brand, or 500, but most of the time we ignore the fact that data is what makes us successful. And it drives our ability to control the experience of the prospect or the customer, because we understand why they're interacting with us. And it's marketer's job, it's not IT, it's not operations, it's marketer's job to fully understand what that data is telling us and keeping it clean. Because bad data is bad data, and it screws you up. And you can imagine what happens when robots get smart enough and they realize your data is bad and they just shoot you. No, I'm kidding, they won't do that. Okay, so I wanted to just go through briefly, when we talk about numbers keeping score and numbers that drive better actions, this is, as a marketer, this is my tech stack. I wanted to show this to you, it's a lot. I'm only gonna focus on one of these because the one thing I learned at Salesforce, which when I was exact target, we were bought by Salesforce, one of the largest software companies in the world. They did something called the waterfall goal orientation, which they call V2 mom. And it completely changed the way I thought about goals. What happened was the executive team got in a room and said, what are the five things we need to focus on for this year? And then they broke it out by quarter. How do those goals align to the five things or three to five things we want to do this year? And then they had a software called V2Mom that allowed every single employee to map goals all the way up to them. So it was a bottom-up approach to strategy. And what changed the way I thought about it was I could actually track my personal contribution in the company, a huge 20,000 employee company, to Mark Benioff, the CEO. So a great software is called BetterWorks, if you guys want to try this out, where it allows your entire team to build out goals and numbers based off of a core set of goals instead of using like an Excel spreadsheet or Google Sheet. BetterWorks is a great way to do that. It allows you to fully manage the customer journey in general because I believe that marketers and communicators and probably some CEOs in the room should be involved in the entire customer journey and employee journey period. Because what we're looking at is that the highest performing teams figured out how to cross that gap that typical businesses did not figure out and it helped them understand that we are consumers at a core and we need to try to understand how to tell our brand story as close as possible with how the consumer tech companies of the world are doing it because they're doing it well. Because as marketers, the creation and management of the experience, whether that's employee, customer, prospect, is the only thing that makes you relevant. That's it. The management of the experience, and that involves every point along the journey.